Hello and welcome to today's uh, webinar, which is entitled Global Order in Crisis Mode, Coping Strategies for the West. My name is David Leisner. I'm the Executive Director of Atlantic Brücke and on behalf of our institution and the American Council in Germany, I would like to welcome you to this digital panel. It's part of the virtual German-American conference, uh, which this year we are hosting as a series of joint webinars with experts and policymakers from both sides of the Atlantic. And we are very pleased that many members of, and alumni of both organizations have joined us. And we'd like to encourage you to participate in our discussion. Please use the chat function of Zoom, and I will try to include as many questions as possible. But first of all, I would like to briefly uh, introduce our guests. Uh, first of all, Ambassador Victoria Newland. Uh, she's joining us from Washington. She's senior counselor at the Albright Stonebridge Group, a global uh, strategic advisory and commercial diplomacy firm based in Washington, DC. She's also a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, distinguished practitioner in grand strategy at Yale University, and a member of the board of the National Endowment for Democracy. Uh, she looks back on a remarkable career in diplomacy as um, a U.S. diplomat for 32 years. Ambassador Newman served as Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs uh, from 2013 until 2017 under President Obama and Secretary Kerry. She was State Department spokesperson during Secretary Hillary Clinton's tenure and U.S. Ambassador to NATO, of course, during President George W. Bush's second term. Uh, warm welcome to you. Um, Ambassador dear Victoria, it's an honor to have you on the call. Thanks, David. It's great to be here with our, our friends at the Council. And our speaker on the German side joining us from Berlin is Omid Nuripur. He's a member of the board of Atlantic Brücke. He has been a member of the German federal parliament since 2006 for the German Green Party. He's the party's spokesman on foreign affairs, member of the Foreign Affairs Committee, the Defense Committee, and the Committee on Human Rights. Omid, uh, great to have you as well. Thank you for having me. Um, unfortunately, our chairman, Sigmar Gabriel, um, who was um, announced to, to take part in today's call, cannot take part due to an urgent and unforeseen obligation. He's very sorry for that and uh, sends his warm regards. We are very sorry for this change in our lineup today, but are even more grateful that you, Victoria, and Omid have, have joined us. Um, so, Victoria, if I may start off with a first question to you. Um, when partners are faced with a crisis, there are two possible reactions. Um, everyone looks after himself herself primarily, or one uses the crisis as an opportunity to join forces and work together. Based on what we, what we are seeing right now, how stable is the transatlantic partnership in this time of global crisis? Is it, is it functioning? Well, first, David, thanks to the Council, thanks to all of you and to my friend Umid for, for joining. It's a great opportunity to talk to our friends across the Atlantic. Uh, David was wrong. I am not in Washington. I am on the North Carolina coast, and I thought in honor of this transatlantic conversation, I'd give you a picture of the Atlantic uh, from outside my windows here today. So anyway, great to be with you. Look, over the medium term, um, I continue to have great confidence in the transatlantic relationship because we need each other, because we do not maintain our security, our prosperity, our values, or our health without each other. However, I think it's relatively well known that I am extremely critical of what's happened over the last three years, the way the fabric of the relationship has been uh, torn, the way we have stressed uh, our security ties, our economic ties, uh, that uh, from the White House too often we hear criticism of allies and we hear uh, coddling of authoritarians and dictators and that that has continued. And that this America first approach to the world is increasingly becoming America alone. And we see what that brings for my country, uh, let alone for the transatlantic uh, relationship uh, through this awful period of the COVID-19 epidemic, where we have uh, one of the highest uh, levels of virus and we are not getting our arms around it because we are trying to go it alone. And we're not even very successfully going it alone, as you know. Uh, the president has failed to provide national leadership. He has failed to use our federal system to convene governors and local officials to work together. Um, and, you know, our results by the numbers are abysmal, particularly as compared to uh, a country like Germany, which has deployed 
um, under the chancellor's leadership, uh, a really uh, federal approach. She, she, I noticed that every time she makes a policy statement, she has just met with all of the um, the uh, provincial leaders before she's made her decisions, and you have based your choices firmly on science, on testing, and you've been able to harness national and local power to accelerate your ability to deliver services, whether it is protective gear, whether it is testing, uh, whether it is economic relief. So um, my grave concern is that we certainly in the United States, and we'll see how the U.S. voters appreciate this in November, we certainly in the United States would have done far better in this crisis uh, if we had been working with allies and partners on everything from uh, stockpiling medical equipment back in December and January, putting money jointly into uh, virus research, uh, into testing, um, and if we had coordinated our fiscal and monetary stimulus as we did in 2008, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, across both Republican and Democratic administrations. And then more broadly, um, you know, the U.S. has, I believe, a very strong track record of global leadership uh, since the end of, uh, of World War II. And we've been not only absent from the field, we've been completely selfish. Uh, and selfish in not even doing basic things like dropping the tariffs that we have uh, on Europe uh, at this time so that we can all work together on economic recovery. So I am in a very critical place, but I do not think uh, that this is irreversible, nor do I think that we have frayed these relationships or the institutions that bind us to the point of breaking um, if we get an electoral change here in November. Um, if we have four more years of this from the United States, I think uh, it will be very, very difficult. And I hope we'll talk about how Europe can then really take up the banner of defending liberalism, because that's going to be necessary. I will pause there. Mm. Thank you so much, Victoria. If I may just uh, pass on to you, uh, Omid, what is, what is your view on the current situation with a you know, particular view on the transatlantic partnership. Um, as in German, we say, Krise als Chance, a crisis as an opportunity. You know, is, is it possible in your view that, uh, you know, in particular with regard to cooperation and health and global aid, that, uh, you know, this crisis might uh, hold the potential for strengthening our transatlantic ties? Or is, do we just see, you know, the manifestation of national egoism here? There is a very famous quote, I think, given by, by President Roosevelt saying, uh, never, never miss a good crisis. Uh, and of course, and I just can refer to that, what, what Victoria just said and underline that. Uh, obviously, the, the opportunity now we have to take up, the take is, 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 of course, the question of co co cooperation. We're seeing that researchers all across the globe are saying that they can deliver a vaccine in, in, in 18 months. We'd never had that before in any other diseases we got. We never had such a, such a clear timetable and, and uh, a prognosis of, of getting vaccine that fast. So it shows that definitely it, it's good to cooperate. Um, it's obvious that the transatlantic relations are unbreakable because they're about people-to-people -people relations. It's about, about uh, civil societies uh, who are entangled. Uh, we... Uh, the Germans uh, know that we uh, we uh, had a huge benefit of, of, of this, uh, this this friendship and, and, and partnership for the last decade. Uh, of course, we know that there are huge challenges, and to be honest, the challenges never have been that big, and not, not, never have been that that heavy. The the, the, the load of, of, of the challenges is, is uh, which is put at the at the bridge uh, across the pond is is is, is, is huge in these days, uh, and but it was even before the pandemic. And then now we have a, a worldwide crisis, which is of course coupled to this to the to the, to the competition uh, competition of, of of the systems we already had. And mm -hmm. this moment, it's obvious that we have to to take the banner, as Victoria said, to 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 pick up the banner of liberalism and then democracy against those who try to prove that the, the, their efficiency of the Chinese system is, is the better way to to deal with that, uh, with, with that kind of, of crisis, which is definitely not 
there are a lot of proofs on that. We could, we could maybe uh, 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 spend a few words on that later on also. Uh, but it's obvious that countries like China and of course Russia, we, we can see in the middle of, of Europe in these days in, in Belarus, they are not able to deal with, with, with the crisis. And this is why it would be much more important, not only for, for, for the health, for, for, for the sake of, of the, our people, but also for, for the power projection of democracies, uh, having in a United States which is delivering. And uh, the rest is, is, is already has been said by, by Victoria. Mm. Thank you, Omid. Um, let us maybe um, you know, open, open up the scope a little bit and look at the, at the geopolitical implications. Uh, Victoria, back in uh, uh, summer last year, you, uh, in an interview with the German newspaper Handelsblatt, you suggested that authoritarian regimes were increasingly gaining influence. You warned that they were undermining the rules of the international order. Now, in these days, it's often claimed that the coronavirus plays into the hands of autocrats, since they can impose restrictions and control resources um, more easily by virtue of their con uh, constitution. They are supposedly better able to deal with a crisis uh, of this magnitude than democracies. Um, how would you assess the impact of the corona crisis on the global influ influence uh, uh, of autocratic regimes? Well, first of all, David, let me just say that uh, picking up on what we could, should, would be doing together as a liberal democratic family. I think we want to look not simply at getting back to where we were, we want to look at building back better together. And uh, this is going to segue into how to think about the authoritarian narrative. But, you know, we should be doing things like, uh, as we uh, stimulate our economies, how do we ensure that we are protecting uh, small and mid medium-sized business? How do we ensure we are protecting the middle class and using this stimulus to help close the income inequality gaps that have led to a fertile ground for populists and that we saw even before the virus? How do we invest uh, with some of this stimulus money in broadband and in 5G that is made by the democracies? Uh, that also helps stimulate middle class economy because more people uh, can engage in innovation and technology, et cetera, particularly at a time where we may not be going to work in the traditional way for at least a year. How do we build back better in green technology? Can we give tax incentives, et cetera, for um, those industries and manufacturing uh, entities that take this opportunity to come off of coal and get on cleaner sources of energy? Um, as the e as big EU is thinking about doing itself, you know, if we were working together, we could be using this this stimulus and this moment um, to coordinate how how we do that. Um, but it's also important to coordinate how we defeat the authoritarian narrative that a they were doing it better before the virus and now they're doing it better even better. Um, you know, I think the Russians are having a hard time making that narrative right now, at least as the the virus is is um, you know rocking across uh, the country from from Moscow and from Petersburg. But the Chinese are very uh, working very hard, whether it is um, you know the the export of of protective gear, uh, whether it is uh, trying to accelerate their own science, whether it is claiming that they had a better handle on their citizenry and were able to lock them down. But the authoritarians have built in uh, deficiencies and negatives uh, that we don't have. For example, they lie to their citizens. Uh, and both in China and in Russia, we see authoritarian leaders lying to their citizens about the effect of this virus. And that severs the trust and makes it harder for them to control their populations. They also don't innovate like we do when we stimulate innovation. Um, so combination of US and Europe together, we have at least 10 lines of uh, virus vaccine testing going on now among us. And I predict that we will beat the authoritarians at coming to those solutions. But how do we turn that scientific collaboration and learning and stimulation of innovation into next generation um, health acceleration for, for our populations and get more citizens into the health economy 
as a way to, to innovate as well. So I could go on and on about this. Um, I, I think the authoritarians and particularly uh, the Chinese are, have a narrative that they will pursue. Uh, but again, we defeat ourselves in the democratic world when we don't work together, when we don't harness the power that we have, whether it is as innovators, whether it is as supporters of our citizens and in, in conversation and compact with our citizens, uh, whether it is um, being able to um, keep our economies strong and vibrant and recovering well together. So, you know, if we pull our act together, if we work together, uh, we have all the tools in our bag, uh, not only to come out of this better and stronger, uh, but certainly to put the lie to this narrative that authoritarians somehow deliver better for citizens. They don't, and we know it, but we haven't been delivering, at least we haven't, well enough for our own to make that case. Mm. Thank you so much, um, Umid. Over, over to you. Um, of course, in Germany, we also had a vivid debate on you know, how to balance our democratic values and the opportunities within tech, uh, in particular with regard to tracking and, and you know, developing, um, implementing uh, apps that would allow tracking uh, the spread of the virus. Um, how, how do you see this debate in Germany unfolding? Is it, you know, uh, do we have, is there a new twist to that debate uh, given, given the crisis that we are facing at the moment since data protection was always one of the key values really in Germany and uh, certainly more of a sensitive issue uh, here uh, as it is in the US, I would suspect. Uh, and still is, and it, but this is not, a, not an obstacle for, for such an app. And, it, and it's obvious that we're waiting for that all the time and I hope that it definitely comes very soon. Uh, so, so we can, um, open more and more uh, part of, uh, of, uh, of uh, public life. Um, it's, of course, it's obvious, you, you can see it in a lot of countries that, that the tracing and then tracking is, is, is key for, for opening, for reopening uh, uh, public. And uh, this is what we hope and, and pray and, and work on and, and that all the time. But it doesn't mean that we have to just, just, just push away uh, data protection. There are a lot of ways. And you, this is the debate we have in, in a lot of democracies. Uh, there, there are a lot of ways to, to combine that. And uh, uh, we, we, you can see statements of even from, from Chaos C uh, Computer Club saying that, of course, they, 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 there are some, some conditions they are they elaborating and then referring to, but of course also they are um, supporting such an app coming and I hope that it finally comes. Mm. Victoria, how is that? Again, David, I think, you know, this is an area where we should have been working together, even under the Obama administration, much more closely. We did work together when the EU instituted a GDPR uh, the U.S. had intensive consultations both with na nation states and with the EU and the way uh, your EU legislation came out I think was a market leader for the democratic world um, and was certainly something that we could have we can and and could accommodate and and I think we should be picking up some of the lessons there but more broadly um, this whole technological universe is uh, what you know gave the initial promise of making the democracy stronger and then morphed into a tool that was better deployed uh, by the authoritarians, whether it was a tool of controlling their own citizens or spreading disinformation or infecting our democracies and getting into our national conversations or as, as a, a tool of attack uh, on critical infrastructure, et cetera. So here again, we have a common problem. We need to pull our act together and look at appropriate regulation uh, of the tech industry, appropriate monitoring of the ability to use these technologies to undercut democracy, to undercut citizen freedom, et cetera, and come up with common protocols um, as we did, uh, unfortunately, frankly, during the Cold War with regard to uh, the, the, the trade and commerce and other high technologies. And at the same time, continue to stimulate our own innovation so we stay ahead on these kinds of things. But you know, tech appropriately used is the answer uh, to economic recovery, to closing income inequality, 
to continuing to, to innovate and protect our citizens. But we have to work on these, on these problems, whether it's privacy problems, whether it is the ability to um, abuse these technologies, or whether it is the, the national security aspects of it. Thank you. And let me just emphasize that there are already a number of solutions uh, when it comes to tracking the virus, uh, which are in accordance with GDPR, as they only measure proximity and not geolocalization, for example. So let's hope that uh, the US and Germany or Europe altogether will find ways to cooperate on uh, common standards and regulation. So um, maybe let us uh, focus a little bit more on China. Uh, we have already touched upon the role of China. There is actually a question now from our viewers. And the question goes as follows. If we manage to find a vaccine, that's fantastic. And then we have to manufacture it. And we know that pharmaceutical manufacturing is heavily dependent on facilities in India and China. What are the consequences of this? Of this? So this question is not directed to any uh, one in particular. Would you like to comment on that? Maybe Umid or? Yeah, sure. I can, I can start and, and uh, uh, Victoria can, can correct me now. First, I think India is not a problem. You know, of course, the, the Modi is not the nicest person I've ever seen in my life, but, but at the end of the day, India is a democracy. Uh, second, let me come back to the competition of the systems I, I, I mentioned before. Uh, one of the reasons why the pandemic is now a, a, a global one, at least the pandemic, the first ever, is that the system of the Communist Party in China is just unable to face truth. That means that someone in Wuhan has a huge problem and he just does not dare to tell that to his bosses in Beijing. This is the core of the system, the core of the system that, that, that you have to deliver. There is no failure culture there. You can survive within the system, within the party. This is, I think, something we should, should talk about because it's, it's important for, for the narratives. And maybe I can give you later on a couple of figures on, 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 on how China is saving the world and, and, and the number of the masks and uh, what, what does it mean they, what they're doing. They're just, just one and I could, could add a lot of uh, later on. They delivered, you, you saw all of this, um, this, this propaganda, uh, mask deliveries they, they, they brought to Italy, to Serbia and a lot of other places. And we saw the, the, the reaction, which was, uh, which were very people of, 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 of very, very, very shaken, even. The mayor of, uh, of uh, Firenze wanted his people to hug Chinese. Um, we saw Vucic going around uh, kissing the, the, the Chinese flag, saying that this, that's Mr. Xi is, is the only friend his country has. Just two, first one is, you're talking about a recovery fund for the European Union, including more than 1 trillion million euros. Of course, this could be a help for Italy. What the Chinese delivered to Italy where has been 200,000 masks. 200,000 masks is, is maybe enough for two days for just for the medical staffers in, in, in Lombardy. This is ridiculous. But, but they said, hey, look at that, we saved Italy. And, and what Mr. Vucic, by the way, didn't mention was the delivery of the Chinese has been paid by the European Union. So um, the question is, why is their show so effective? The answer is because we are not telling to the people what we are doing. We are not picking up this, this ball of, of this huge game named uh, power projection, which is part of the competition of our um, systems. Um, I think we need cooperation with China. Um, they're not only in a question of, of, of a vaccine, but we also need containment. And I think these are the two uh, headlines we, we always had to, to, to uh, work on together, of course, with our American friends in China. Uh, we didn't enough. We didn't do that enough for, for the last years uh, because of a lot of reasons. One of the reasons is the hesitation of the American administration to cooperate on this. But uh, it's also about the Europeans not, uh, not uh, uh, standing up and saying that there are things they bring into, the, into a cooperation with the Americans how we can deal with China when it comes to cooperation and, contain and containment. But at the end of the day, we see that Ch Chinese now are trying to withdraw from any kind of funding of a common development of, uh, of a vaccine because they think the day after they could have a huge benefit if they have it by themselves. And of course, they are afraid and they are scared to death by the perspective that the first country who would bring a vaccine to the market could be Taiwan. 
so this is why they, they and would be a dream, by the way, uh, but this is why they, they do not uh, cooperate on this. And these are the issues we have to talk about much, much louder. Hmm. Victoria, um, it's, it's of course not a secret that many, American, uh, many, many Americans actually um, on both uh, sides of the aisle are not very happy with the German approach towards China. Um, of course, you know, there are huge economic implications on the German side and it has often been criticized that Germany is not clear in its positions, that it um, doesn't really know its adversaries or isn't clearly naming them, um, that we are you know, we don't have a clear course uh, with regard to the 5G question and many other issues. Um, could you maybe elaborate on that a little bit, how that now plays out in, in, you know, in, the, in the current debate in the Democratic Party, but also in the Republican Party? Is there, you know, is, is there really a shared understanding that Germany does not have a clear course um, uh, in its China policy and that this might actually be a threat to the transatlantic partnership? Well, first of all, I would just say for your German audience, uh, something that they already know. It is the, I think one of the only bipartisan issues in national security in the United States is concern about China. Uh, and frankly, uh, there is concern across the political spectrum and it predated the pandemic, but the pandemic has obviously made China into a public enemy, and you see the Trump ad administration trying to accelerate that. Um, so you are going to have a tough US-China policy, no matter who is elected in November. The question is, can it be an effective China policy? And from where I'm sitting, it will only be an effective China policy if it is tightly and well coordinated with allies and not just European allies, but also with Asian allies, Japan, Taiwan, um, South Korea, Australia, India, of course, uh, if we can, if we can get there. Um, and, you know, this is within our capacity to do. It is not in anybody's interest to create a permanent enemy of China or to try to cut China off and isolate it completely from the world. Um, you know, our romantic strategy that integration of China into the global system would make it a responsible stakeholder has failed, but that doesn't mean that together we can't get tougher and more coordinated about the left-right limits of Chinese behavior in the international system. So what does that mean? That means essentially working together on uh, what security moves are acceptable and what are unacceptable and our united position in countering moves that are unacceptable, whether it's threatening of Taiwan or closing of the Straits or any of those things. Similarly, uh, I am completely where OMID is that, you know, two years ago, uh, Europeans paraded through Washington and said, let us work together on the economic um, copyright intellectual property problems that we have with China. Don't tariff us, let's together tariff China. If we had done that, we would have had a much more coordinated and united front. We could have each borne a bit of the financial burden of trying to um, stop these massive state subsidies and stealing of, uh, of uh, Western technology and IP and uh, you know, market fairness, and we might be well further along than we are. We can still get back to, to that kind of a system. Um, and similarly, you know, a China that's willing to cooperate in international organizations, as we had good cooperation, because we put the hard work in and because we were unified around the Paris climate uh, talks, we need to get back to that. We can't have uh, a global climate policy without China. Um, similarly, if we're not competitive, if we don't have a free and democratic alternative to Huawei 5G, of course they're going to dominate. And then the final piece is for a lot of the world that needs our assistance and support, if China is able to pour money into Africa and Latin America and Southeast Asia with no rules and with rapacious debt standards, et cetera, and we do nothing about it and we offer no alternative for the development of these countries, then we're going to get, we're going to reap what we sow there. So again, we need a coordinated approach to things like Belt and Road. It's not beyond our 
capability to do that. I think it will require a much more intensive and comprehensive and, and clear conversation across the Atlantic. For example, in the 5G world, is there such a thing as the core of a system versus the periphery? How do you define that? How do you protect the core? We've done this before in terms of blocking technology to the Soviet Union, but being able to maintain um, some commercial relationship and some um, and our innovation base. So we just need to get back to those first principles and the way we approach it. I hope that if uh, a candidate and former Vice President Biden wins in November, our, our first stop will be with the allies. He has said that and China will be, and a common approach to China will be one of the main issues uh, at the top of the list to try to get our act together collectively. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, that ties in nicely actually with one of the questions uh, here from our viewers. Um, I was just about to ask you, Umid, where do you see the main friction points really in the China policy transatlantically? So, you know, where, where, where are the points of disagreement? Um, but uh, to include here one of the questions from our viewers, how um, to you, Omid, uh, how do you predict the German government will handle China during its upcoming EU Council Presidency? What are your expectations for the 27 plus one leaders meeting in Leipzig? I, I think the question of the friction has two parts. The first part has been just has just been answered by, by Victoria. So let me focus on, on, on the European side. Um, we are facing a dividing policy by the Chinese toward the European Union. This is why they talk about, we talk about 16, now 17 plus one, they talk about one plus 16 and 17. And uh, we are seeing a bunch of countries within Europe who are not willing to even raise their hand when it's come to the EU Council and to the question of condemning um, human rights, worst human rights violations in, in China. So, um, of course, it's, um, it's uh, sad to see that the American administration is not, not, not really understanding Europe and not would be, it be ready to cooperate in China when it comes to that. It's not only China. Um, let me quote a person from out of the administration I saw two years ago, uh, one week after 2018, um, 8th of May, I think, when uh, President uh, Trump announced that the Americans kind of withdraw from the JCPOA, the, the, the nuclear deal with Iran. Uh, one week after that, I was uh, visiting uh, one of the members of security, National Security Council in, in the White House. And when I was telling him that this is not that good for Europe, his answer was, uh, and, and this is a, a question of sovereignty, uh, of uh, German and, and European companies not to be targeted by, by secondary sanctions of the Americans. He, he answered, he was confused saying, why are you talking about sovereignty? You are members of the European Union. So there is this huge misunderstanding or, or non-understanding of, of the nature and character of the European Union within the administration, which is bad. But we have our homeworks also. It's obvious that um, there are two or three countries uh, which are helpful for the Chinese to divide us, then we have to, to, to face that also. Uh, but at the end of the day, if there is no way to find a consensus within the council that the Europe goes out and say, this is our policy toward uh, China, and this is our offer for a cooperation with the Americans and with our American friends, then they have, you need coalition of the willings within the EU on that. Then it's about France, Spain and, and, and Germany to come up with a uh, with, with an offer and it did, did not happen. That did not happen for, for, for the last years and that I think it has been a huge mistake. Uh, we have no idea how the uh, Leipzig summit gonna take place. We just know that uh, it won't be in August. It, it, if this was uh, the original plan of, but what we know is that uh, Chancellor Merkel is gonna announce all of these answers on, on May 27th. On May 27th, uh, she just said that a couple of hours ago, she's going to tell us what's going to happen with the presidency, what the plans are, what the schedule is, and then uh, how um, the, the, the EU-China summit is going to take place and when. But it's obvious that it is not only about uh, free trade on, and on Chinese terms. It's also not only about just opening the door for Chinese help for, for a European uh, economic recovery after the pandemic. It's... Uh, 
our job to to push that the European Union and members of the European Union speak about the origins of, of the pandemic and speak about the human rights and the civil rights situation in China. In the shadow of the pandemic, a lot of people did not um, notice that uh, the main part of the leadership of the opposition and the democratic opposition in Hong Kong is now under arrest. Uh, and of course, we know what's going on with the Uyghurs. So these are the issues we have to address, not only because it's our duty, um, it, but also because these are the weak points of their system. We have to talk about it. I couldn't agree more with that. Um, let me just remind about one example, um, and I do think Germany has a huge leadership role to play within the European Union. Uh, when I was at NATO as ambassador 2005 to 2008, we started to see European countries uh, considering selling high-tech weapons to China at a time than when China was getting more and more aggressive in the South China Sea. And first at the NATO platform, but then in US-EU relations and in bilateral consultations with member states uh, and in military to military channels, we, the US, went on a nine month consultation education campaign with European countries and with the institutions to explain the dangers uh, to our common security, but particularly to Asian allies security of some of these systems getting into Chinese hands. And we were able first to pause the sales and then to come up with a common regime of what constituted high tech, what was lower tech and less worrisome and therefore could be traded. So we know how to do this work. We just have to get back to the hard work of doing it. And you know, uh, you are far from China, although it's a major export market. Uh, we are a Pacific country and our supply chains have been deeply enmeshed. So just as we did with sanctions against Russia after Ukraine, we have to really understand each other's issues, security issues, economic issues, um, political issues around these and come and find that common set of actions that we can all take and everybody compromise a little bit. And we've lost the art of being able to do that largely because my country's not trying, uh, but also I would say because the EU is too fractured on some of these issues and particularly is at risk of, uh, I think, um, losing the democratic narrative inside the member states. Uh, you know, when Orban can do what he did in terms of emergency powers um, and suffer no consequences, uh, when he can do what he's been doing over the last four years and still get billions of euros every year in EU cohesion funds right out of the German taxpayers' pocket, uh, which he uses to prop up one man rule, um, you know, he's clearly not meeting European democratic standards anymore. And the question is, what's Europe going to do to protect that internally? Um, now, I say that with all humility, understanding how much violence has been done to democracy in the United States and how much repair work we also have to do. But that'll be part of the work here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, we have already talked uh, quite a bit uh, about China and how China is at least you know, trying to fill the, 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 the vacuum. Um, now, there's a question from um, my good friend Steve Sokol, the president of the American Council in Germany, so the co-host of uh, this discussion here. Um, to you, Umid, as a member of the Bundestag, do you have any thoughts regarding the recent uh, revelations and indeed confirmation that Russia was responsible for hacking the Bundestag? Um, you also wrote an, an op-ed recently on the situation in Russia and uh, the domestic situation and uh, tensions there. So what are your thoughts about you know, Russia's attempts here to increase? expand its spheres of influence and to, to hack the German IT infrastructure. And can I pile on that question to Umid? Um, if it's true, should there be consequences? And how would you propose that be executed? There definitely should be. And uh, this is a, a very unique, unfortunately not new, very unique, but a, a harsh um, act of a violation of our sovereignty we just cannot accept. Um, my job as part of the opposition is not to spend more burden on my chancellor, but she found very, a very clear language yesterday on the floor of the Bundestag saying that this is a part of the, this is part of the hybrid warfare 
of, of Russia against uh, Europe and also Germany, and it's that 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 there should have that there should, there are going to be consequences. The question is which which consequences, and the answer is uh, first I don't know. Second, I I'm hesitating to 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 to, to elaborate concrete ones because I hope that my country does the same like the um, like the, the, the British did after Salisbury, just going to the EU. Um, 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 institutions and, and find a common answer. And, and we know how these institutions are working, so it's, it's better just, just to, to talk with the, with the friends and partners and other members of the European Union and find a common solution and not coming in with a very, very concrete idea, uh, which is then, then uh, could, could tackle by, by the other or the others are not fitting to this or other member say. But it's obvious that we need an answer. And it was a very bad move that there never had been an answer to, to the murderer in the Tiergarten. We had a similar case a couple of months ago where it grew the, the military um, um, intelligence of, of, of Russians killed the Georgian citizen in, in the middle of Berlin. Um, and uh, this guy is now, the murderer is now in prison, but there never had been political consequences of that. And but there had been a very shy language of my government addressing this now it has changed and this is good and now it, it needs obvious that it needs consequences i think we need european solidarity and we had to we had to ask for uh, like the british did so victoria was what would be your view on that that issue i mean of course you know uh, in 2016 we had an, uh, a fierce debate in the us on meddling with the election we are now uh, uh, yeah, heading towards the 2020 election. Um, it seems as if the corona pandemic is very much occupying public discourse. Uh, is that still part of the conversation in, in Washington? You know, the integrity of the election, uh, ways to manipulate it through fake narratives and so on. So is that a topic that has kind of shifted to the background or is it still, uh, you know, um, vividly dis discussed. What is your what is your impression at the moment? Um, well, first, just to underscore uh, something that Umid said, I think one of the problems we've got as a democratic world is that this in instance with the Bundestag happened in 2015. And we are five years later, getting an official report, we just can't operate that way. We've got to have uh, rapid attribution. We've got to have rapid reaction. I think, you know, one of the reasons that Macron was so successful in his first election, in, in his election in defeating Russian attempts to meddle, was that in real time, in the same news cycle, he identified it publicly, called it out, and told his news organizations and his citizens to pay no attention to it. Uh, look, I think in the United States, uh, we have... Um, made significant strides to tighten up the physical technical aspect of how we vote. So the vulnerability in individual states of the Russians or anybody else being able to do what they do at home, you know, change, change, uh, change votes uh, between the voter and the counting. Um, we've hardened a lot of that, not enough, but a lot of it. Um, I think where we are falling down on the job is on the influence campaigns and the Russians have gotten much better. What they do now is instead of coming up with their own co campaigns from whole cloth, they jump onto existing uh, cleavages in the political cloth of the country and try to exacerbate tensions. So you saw that even before the pandemic. Um, you know, being on both sides of Black Side Lives Matters issues and coming up with um, false groups of their own, et cetera. A lot of that we are catching now, but now they're using the pandemic and the very deep political cleavage in the United States about how to react to it to try to exacerbate tensions. Um, all that said, um, we have to be vigilant. I do think our citizens have gotten a little bit uh, better um, at recognizing uh, garbage uh, out there. And I do think the technology companies are getting better at taking down some of this stuff, particularly in response to the pandemic. Um, but we're not uh, strong enough. What I'm actually worried about with regard to the US election, 
Um, yes, I'm worried about interference efforts, uh, but the greater risk at the moment, unfortunately, is how are we going to vote in November? And are we going to come to a consensus across the political divide about uh, standards and, and, you know, the states control this, as in Germany, you understand this system. Um, I don't, I, your voting, I think, is federally mandated, but in our case, uh, voting is state by state. Uh, but are we going to be able to uh, ensure that there are adequate protections for mail-in voting, um, that efforts at voter suppression uh, and voter disenfranchisement by Americans against Americans are defeated. Uh, we need to have significant early voting. We need to deal with the fact that older people are not going to want to come out of their houses. So how do you do, deal with that um, without skewing the vote? And then most dangerous of all, you probably saw in our news, you know, folks like Jared Kushner a couple of days ago batting around the idea of changing the date, which is, you know, just, you know, incomprehensible and inconceivable in our system. So we need to focus very strongly, and I know that um, the, the Democratic team is certainly focusing on this nationally and state by state, and how do we ensure complete enfranchisement in a safe and secure way for any American who wants to exercise his or her right. Mm -hmm. If I may just follow, follow up on that point very briefly, um, and we are approaching the end of our call, and I don't want to keep you for too long, but maybe just for particularly our German viewers, but I'm sure also the uh, American participants would be interested in, in your perspective on how the corona crisis will really play out in the, in the election campaign or in the, in the, in the months to come. Um, has that really fundamentally changed the agenda you know, as no other topic ever before uh, in U.S. elections? Is it now all about corona and its impact on the economy and on jobs? Have all other topics really shifted in the background? How has it, you know, has it impacted on, on, the, on, on the agenda or the, the discourse uh, now in, you know, before the election? Will, will everyone only look at, at the economy now? What, you know, what's, what will be the impact? Well, as in Germany, most... U.S. elections, unless we're in an existential security moment, are about the economy. They're about, you know, as Reagan used to ask, are you better off than you were four years ago, et cetera. Uh, what I would say is that the pandemic, and I think Uman made this point earlier, has exacerbated all of the issues and the tensions that we had before and made, in the case of many American kitchen tables, these issues existential. Um, you know, it's interesting, as I said, I'm not in Washington now, I'm in, I'm down in North Carolina, which is a far more conservative um, red state part of the world than, than where I usually am. And you can really feel the political divide here in the response to the pandemic, uh, you know, with some people being extremely scared and extremely concerned that government hasn't gotten its arms around the health issues that the economy is in free fall, that uh, service workers in particular are suffering the most, that this unemployment support won't go on forever, will their jobs ever come back? Um, but in this state, uh, a much larger percentage saying, you know, this has been exaggerated, it's not that much worse than the flu, why am I forced to close my business or shutter it? Um, it's the liberals who are forcing the conservatives to take these measures. So I think all of the political cleavages that we have will play out in this, in this election, including in the response. Um, you know, is a top-down, trickle-down, take care of the rich and the big corporations first response, which is largely what we've had, um, better? Or does, do you need bigger government and more unity and more alliance uh, in order to deal with these things, which is the traditional democratic uh, approach to things? Now, I do think um, that uh, we're starting to see um, some damage uh, to the president and his party from this, uh, partly because, you know, his personal lack of empathy and his and his, some of the choices that he's made, both in terms of not taking preparedness steps in December and January and February as he should, and then denying the virus, and then suggesting that if you just drink bleach, you'll be fine, um, are beginning to have an effect on his on his numbers, including in some key constituencies uh, like older people who just don't feel like he cares if they live or die. Um, and also in obviously uh, communities of color, which have been 
uh, much more largely affected uh, by this, and now in the farming community where the virus is starting to, to come across and, and affect um, also the ability to produce food and, and get it to market, et cetera. So, so we'll see. I think um, it will be all about the pandemic, but the pandemic is now all about everything. Mm -hmm. Terry, thank you so much. Uh, Wade, would you like to comment on that? Yeah. I think one of the most important uh, common battlegrounds in this day should be fake news and uh, conspiracy theory. Uh, there is no day in this currently where I do not get at least 150 mails, some kind of conspiracy theories about Bill Gates plus. Um, you know, and I would love to see one of these nano chips we all got implemented. So, so we are now uh, obvious about what he's saying. This is so crazy, uh, and and uh, you know, it's so crucial for for democracies to 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 counter fake news. Not only those who are uh, organized and orchestrated, for example, not only but for example, for example, by the Russians. But to be honest, it's absolutely complicated to do so when the leader of the Western world is saying that maybe injection of disinfectant could help. So um, th we have to find platforms on, on this. We have to find a way to, to cooperate on this, uh, not only for the sake of, uh, of Germans and, and, and Americans, but for the world. This is, uh, you know, look at what happened to the Chinese uh, uh, sp speaking uh, or writing media in Australia had been an independent part of it, had been completely eroded uh, because of the Chinese interference there. Uh, this is what is uh, going to happen if you do not stand up uh, quickly and coordinate it, and if you do not cooperate on this. And this would be very helpful to find a way to, to work in this. But this is to be to re just repeat that. If there is a, a Twitter account having 65 million followers now, I think, spreading 12,000 lies in two years, two and a half years, uh, uh, this is not that easy. Thank you, Omid. So certainly one of the uh, many uh, challenges that we share on both sides of the Atlantic and that we have to uh, tackle uh, in collaborative action. And uh, yeah, I think this might be a good moment to actually come to an end for today's conversation. Thank you so much, both of you, Ambassador Victoria Newland, uh, Omid Noriko for joining this call. Thank you so much for sharing your perspective and for taking the time. And thank you to all our viewers and, and listeners for taking part. Uh, this series of our German-American conference uh, in its virtual form will carry on. And uh, yeah, our mission, as well as the ACG's mission, is to keep the channels open in challenging time. Thank you so much and all the best to both of you. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>